Marx, as uh, many of you have noted, probably belongs to the period of the first Industrial Revolution. Are there applications of Marx for the 20th and 21st century? Many of his key concepts, especially alienation, capture conditions of workers in America and throughout the world. However, the key idea of bourgeoisie as owners of the means of production and proletariat as workers fail to conform to the realities of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. New reforms of capitalism and relations of production are explored in the readings for this week. Managerial capitalism emerged in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Perhaps the most famous organizational theorist on the topic was Alfred D. Chandler, who wrote rather extensively about the hierarchical organizations or organizational structures that emerged, especially with railroad construction and transportation. This work is a bit later than Max Weber's and his understanding of bureaucracies, but Chandler noted that with the Second Industrial Revolution, basic decisions regarding production and distribution were increasingly made by teams or hierarchies of salaried professional managers who had little or no equity ownership. This was something new. In the 19th centuries, when Marx was doing his work, owners managed and managers owned. This all changed with the Second Industrial Revolution, which created solutions for communication and distribution through transportation and mass communication innovation. These changes and the consequent high volume in the flow of goods mandated the need for professional managers who could guide and oversee the processes at different levels and in different locations. Managerial hierarchies first appeared in the 1850s to coordinate the movement of trains and the flow of goods across the vast and expanding rail networks. Then, these professional managers and the hierarchical organizational form were deployed to manage the new mass retailing establishments. We've all seen these pictures. Actually, many of us have probably created them. The multifunctional structure, the multidivisional structure. There are also diagrams of organizational hierarchies for geographic, uh, territorial, organizational authority and control. By the late 1970s in advanced industrial economies, professional managers with little or no equity, that is with little or no ownership in the organization, made the key decisions. Some claim that only rarely did owners participate in a full-time basis. However, the data on family-owned and other kinds of ownership of businesses versus public corporations are sparse under any circumstances after the 1970s, the pattern of ownership changed dramatically. Eric Olin Wright provides a critical theory or analytical Marxist understanding of managerial capitalism. He notes the presence of powerful classes that are neither exploiter nor exploited that is, the professional managerial class. They have access to key organizational assets that might be used to exploit workers, but they do not own these, and their interests correspond directly neither with those of the capitalists, that is, of the owners, nor to those of the proletariat or the worker. Individuals in contradictory class locations can take any one of three tax or strategies. They can use their position as exploiter to gain entry into the dominant class. 
they can forge an alliance with the exploiting class, or they can form an alliance with the principal exploited class. Right amidst mention of other professional possibilities that emerged, these are taken up by many sociologists, most notably by Rosabeth Moss Cantor, uh, most notably the emergence of uh, the emerging profession of personnel and then human resource management, which dealt with how best to negotiate the bridge across the divide. William Lozonic and Mary O'Sullivan, contemporary sociologists, note extremely important changes in corporate structure and governance that emerged in the 1970s. The idea of shareholder value took root and gained ground during this period. What does this mean? Who are the shareholders? And what has the impact been? Shareholder value has many faces and appears typically on the front page of the paper almost every day, especially in the business section, typically under the name of ROE, or Return on Equity. This is a key arbitrary metric for measuring or assessing how well companies are doing its numerical vis-a-vis -vis other com competitors in the marketplace. Before the 1970s, or before 1970, investors typically purchased stock and held it so long as the fundamental performance of the company was solid and the dividends remained just a touch higher than bank interest rates. As Lozonic and O'Sullivan note, this picture changed in the 70s due to a number of factors, new international competitors such as Japan, the rise of agency theory, and a shift in focus from managers as professionals to managers as agents of shareholders in whose interests they were to act, the rise of the institutional investor and consequent fiduciary responsibilities, the oil crisis and changes in bank regulations. So, Lazonic and O'Sullivan and others argue, corporate philosophy and strategies moved from retain and reinvest, that is to retain reinvest and pay dividends to downsize and distribute in order to maximize shareholder value. Much has been written about this, including a long series in the New York Times in the 80s on the company as family no more. Professional managers were laid off in vast numbers. Corporate uh, companies, corporate entities disinvested from shop floor skills or shop floor skill development. Investments in research and development and training were reduced, and corporations seem no longer to be managed by anyone, but rather to be driven by markets, temporary agents, and their drive to increase ROE, or return on equity, on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis to meet the expectations of shareholders who could actually terminate their employment if they didn't do this. This is not an easy problem. Who are the shareholders, after all? Aging widows with 401k plans that hold equities, or stocks, may find themselves on the same playing field as CEOs with stock options, valued at over $50 million. So this week, let's try to understand the basic issues. <laughs>